Our program this evening is being led by Brother Dennis Bevins from the Austin Leander Texas Ecclesia, and he'll be leading our evening program tonight entitled The Tabernacle and John's Writings. So, Brother Dennis. So, most of you that knew me before we got here, and anyone who's heard me say anything this week probably by now has figured out that I have tabernacleitis. Um, the study itself actually started when I was doing a study of the epistles of John. And I found myself going in all kinds of places following the tabernacle, going, hey, you got to get back to John eventually. So um, what, I've, what I've done, there's no way we could go through all of these. So when the time is up, we'll just say we're done. I'll jump to the last couple slides. But the idea behind this really is seeing how the tabernacle, although it's a central theme of the scripture, how much it was embedded into so many things John said. And some of them are probably were obvious to many, but just not me. And I went, wow, how did I not know that? And then as I shared that with other people, I got the look like, yeah, everybody knows that. Uh, okay, we do now. Um, and others, I found almost like, how did I not catch that before? And other people were like, yeah, we didn't catch this. So it made me feel a little bit better. At least I wasn't the only one clueless. So many times in, uh, in our Bible study, we find things that are new to us. And it, it, it reminds me, every time I find something that's new, that perhaps somebody else here knew it and they just didn't share it. So the more we share the things we read in Scripture, the odds of us catching lessons sooner uh, it comes much faster because you might have caught this 20 years ago and, well, why'd you let me wait till now to get it, is what the question is. Now, for tabernacleitis, to my knowledge, there is no cure for this disease. The only hope one has is to accept and enjoy the affliction and continue to read the inspired word of the Father. You'll see it everywhere. Not only the word tabernacle, see those I catch. When the word tabernacle's there, I make the connection all by myself. But words like dwell or abide, or sometimes the word for abide in Greek is translated continue. And when we see those words, now I pause and consider and look for the tabernacle. Uh, it, it came up, as I mentioned, in my studies of, jo of John, and it made me rethink about some of the most often quoted in, uh, verses in Scripture, especially quoted by Christadelphians around the world for years. And I did not, until recently, realize that that was a connection to the tabernacle. So, let's get to that. Study started in the letters of John, so let's start in the letters of John. So, 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 that we have seen and heard and declare we unto you, that also you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So the purpose of hearing, seeing, and sharing is not only with each other, but also with the Father and the Son. Uh, this theme starts in the wilderness, and it's built upon as a major theme in Scripture. So Every slide we look at is going to have some connection to the tabernacle. Now, I, I figure it's probably worth saying uh, at the beginning. I think I said this once earlier in the week, but I don't remember if it was to the teens or in the exhort, so I'm just going to say it again. Um, and that is that our God chose to put this tent in the middle of his family. He could have put a castle on a hill with barbed wire, a moat around it, a few gators to gnaw on people to get close, but he doesn't. He doesn't want us to be looking at him as beyond our reach and beyond our hope, but rather he wants us to see him as the center of our life, the center of our worship, and he wants to be in close proximity to us, which is why I love pictures of the tabernacle where the camp is around it. Um, Honorable mention to Brother Matt Nor uh, Norton. If you've not heard his uh, talks on the tabernacle, they are absolutely worth listening to. That was the first time I heard somebody say the body parts. I mean, I think I used different words. He was probably a little more, you know, couth than I will ever be. Um, but the, the concept of human body parts words being used in the tabernacle itself, the ornaments in, the furniture in, the tent itself, where other Hebrew words existed, we see things like mouth and ribs and ears and legs and feet so that we can see us, humans, as part of this tabernacle effort. Now, the first word, time the word fellowship that we focused on in this first verse, uh, the first time that word appears is Acts 2, 
uh, and 42, which says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So our role in the ecclesia is to make sure we stay connected to apostolic doctrine that they heard, they saw, and they shared. Knowing the truth is only useful if it motivates us to live the truth. Reading, studying the Word of God has to change who we are. So living the truth is to make sure that we focus our efforts on personal growth and how that impacts the ecclesia. Here's 1 John 2 and 5. Whoso keepeth his word in him, verily, is the love of God perfective, whereby we know that we are in him. Now, the word perfected in the Greek is completed, and this no word is the intimate knowledge word. So hereby is the love of God completed that we intimately know that we are in him. And so this talks about a maturity of love. Now, a theme that comes through, John, that uh, both the letter and the epistles is the concept of the love of God. And certainly, in, our, in maturity as we learn to love, we know the commands, we keep the commands, we guard his plan and the word of truth by living the gospel and demonstrating love one to another. Because herein shall you know that they are my disciples, that they love one another. So it's not an academic exercise. It's something our God has given us to refine our character that we might learn how to love each other so that he can reciprocally love us and make us part of his permanent family forever. Now, the, the litmus test for this, my, I, my dad used to say this all the time, uh, was 1 Corinthians 13. We're not going to do it, but it's an, a good object lesson. You know, you, you might have done this before. Maybe my dad wasn't the only one to ever say it, just the only one I've ever heard say it. But have you ever read 1 Corinthians 13? Well, you know, charity suffereth long, is forgiving, blah, 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 blah. Read 1 Corinthians 13 and insert your name for charity and see how long you get without smirking. You know, Dennis suffers long. I'm, so, I'm already smirking. You, know, you, you read it and it's kind of a test to go, am I developing the character of God? And that's one way to stop, look and say, yes or no, I've got some work to do. All right, let's get to some tabernacle words. Verse, two, so verse 6 of 1 John 2. <clears throat> he that saith, <coughs> excuse me, he abideth in him, ought himself to so walk, even as he walked. That's a reference to John 15, verses 1 and 7, if you want to take note. The word ought in the Greek is to owe or to be in debt. We have all been bought with a price. So this walk, 1 Peter 2 and 21 says, For whereunto you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, living, <clears throat> leaving us an example that we should follow his steps or walk his way. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we certainly have seen that in our, our Noah classes this week. John 8 and 12. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So this concept of abiding in him starts with now. Starts with us abiding in the word, around the word, with the word, so that we might abide or tabernacle with the Father and the Son forever. Because the alternative is that the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God tabernacles forever. So that's what's on the table. <clears throat> we either get to go the way of the flesh, or we get to go the way of the Father. And by the way, this water's not helping yet. But you know how I'll grab the diet soda if I need to. So far, so good. It's too late. My voice is going to sleep, I guess. All right. <clears throat> Anything in this world is temporary and fleeting. For it to be abiding and rooted in love, it's got to be something that's based on the will of the Father. Uh, verse 6 uh, is what we just referenced. So these uh, three verses, 1 John 2, uh, 15 through 17, perhaps the most quoted in this letter, and we all know them well, but tonight we're going to focus on the opportunity to abide with the Father forever. So we go just a few verses down. This is verse 24. Let that therefore abide in you, <clears throat> which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So the word abide, the word 
um, uh, remain and the word continue are all the same word. That's, that's three different times that we have this uh, abide word, which ties us directly to the tabernacle in this verse. So it made a major focal point as we get towards the end of the second chapter of 1 John. Some good references. I think we already mentioned John 15 and 4. Another one's Ephesians 3 and 17. So we'll emphasize that later. Hold the thought. Verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you, but the same anointing teach you of all things. And his truth is no lie. Even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. There's no need for fleshly philosophy. There's no need for us to find something new under the sun. No need for us to reinvent the truth to make it more interesting. The Word of God is there and prepares us to be with Him forever. It's nothing that needs our help. It's something there to help us. Biggest danger of the truth today is getting bored with the truth. And we've seen, brothers and sisters, this has happened to, where it feels like, they were so solid at one point, but now all their sources seem to be, whether it's Jewish commentaries or other Christian commentaries, introducing new thoughts and ideas because they're losing excitement for the truth. And we've got to keep that excitement level there because of the depth of Scripture. You and I have the opportunity to plumb a little deeper than we did last year. And the studies of this year make the studies of next year more interesting. And I can't tell you how many times... The Bible, the Bible study I did this year changed my Bible readings ne uh, next year. An example of that is tomorrow night when we do the history of the world and the children of Leah. That was the direct result of a Bible study on the book of Daniel. Well, what does Daniel have to do with the children of Leah? Well, I'll show up tomorrow night and you'll find out. But the point is, I had read about the children of Leah 20 times at least, maybe 50, I don't know, a lot. It wasn't new material to me. But, whoa, how did I never catch that? The study of Daniel allowed me to see something I never would have seen otherwise, or I don't think I would have seen otherwise. But once I saw that, it was obvious. And that can happen to every single one of us. I'm sure it does to some degree. Now, little children, abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So if we are constantly abiding in Christ, we will be absolutely ready for him as, his, at his return. So if we can prepare ourselves to be part of that camp now, why it's not much of a stretch to be part of that camp eternally. Matthew 7, great reference for this. Not everyone, verses, this is starting at verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Interesting that Jesus qualifies that is, who is your brother and sister? Your family's outside. Wait, he who does the will of my Father which is heaven, the same as my mother, my sister, and my brother. So doing the will of our Father not only identifies us as the brothers and sisters of Christ, but it's qualifying us for the, to be part of the family of God. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. For us to intimately know the Father and the Son, we must see ourselves as part of his family now. Take the lessons that he has provided for us, because what is at stake is eternity. Here's 1 John 3, verses 5 and 6. You know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Obviously talking about Jesus. Whoso abideth in him and sinneth not, whoso sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now this word know, is the, the uh, one in verse 5, that you know is the perceive word. You perceive he was manifested. Uh, Good reference for us here is John 1 and 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of the world which taketh away sin. Now the word abide is the same as the word to dwell noted in chapter 2 verse, verse 3. So we've got this same concept, to dwell or abide in Christ that sins not. Now in verse 6 the word is different for no. This is the intimate word. Whoso dwells in him sins not and whoso sins has not seen him, neither intimately knows him. 
We cannot dwell with Christ and live a life of lawlessness. We choose to live a life serving our own lust. We intimately cannot know the love of the Father or the work of the Son. So knowing that we are sinners, that we want to look past that sin, achieve forgiveness for that sin, and make a change in our life, it's a continual growing process demonstrating the love of the Father to each other. We then have an opportunity to abide with the Son and to be paired with Him in His kingdom. Verse 14, you know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. And so now we have the context. It's going to get more personal now. So before we were speaking in very generic terms, but now we have the opportunity to have life. But if we do not know how to agape, that's the verb form of agapeo, this is agapeo, both times the word love is on the screen, If we do not have a self-sacrificing love for our brethren, then we are abiding in death. We're tabernacling in the dust. This is mutually exclusive. Love equals life. Absence of love equals death. So learning to love each other is paramount to us being seen not just as his disciples, but as as us being part of his family forever. Here, Let's look at Matthew 7 again. Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to the destruction, and many, uh, there, and many there be which go thereat. But straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Of course, verses we all know, the concept of the road less traveling making all the difference. It's why fellowship based on correct doctrine is a starting point and love as a springboard is critical to our walk to the kingdom. Walking God's way is only possible if we are dwelling in love. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now this is the seer perceive word again. You perceive that no murderer hath eternal life in him. Now the word murderer only appears three times in the New Testament. Those two, anyone want to guess where the other one is? John 8 and 44. You can check it out when you've got some extra time. You can't sleep tonight. It's actually a reference back to some very specific words that Jesus said. And in that context, it can be very scary. Jason referred to this earlier today. You have heard that it is said of them in old time, you should not kill. But whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, Whosoever is angry angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, is in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Now he's talking in an ecclesial setting, which puts self-serving anger and disrespect on the same level as murder. What else it does is if we refer to our brother as a fool... It's being cast as murder in the eyes of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying this is a one-and-done process. Our Father is capable of forgiving real murder, let alone saying the wrong thing about your brother murder. But the point of this is, that's how it's seen in the eyes of our Lord. It is healthy for us to have open discussion about how this can happen and how we can avoid it, because it does happen all the time. You know, we, we love the psalm, the, the blessings of uh, the the. Um, I mess up the first part of dwelling together in unity is falling down Aaron's beard. I'm one of the Psalms. I just butchered it. But the point of that is the concept of us dwelling together in unity, we all agree with. But we know that's not easy because we all see things differently. We have to be careful that when we see it differently, we can still demonstrate love in the difference so that we can be respectful to each other and grow together as opposed to starting to discredit the other brother or sister because they disagree with us. And it happens all the time. We perceive, that's uh, actually a poor translation. Sorry, Jason, if you're watching, you're not here, so I can say it all I want. That's a bad translation. This word perceive is actually the intimate word for knowledge in Greek, that we intimately know the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is obviously talking about Christ, which is why of God is in italics. You'll 
you, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that. Good. Hereby, we intimately know love because Jesus laid down his life for us. We then need to lay down our lives for our brethren, the concept of agape. Second John chapter, uh, chapter, second John verse six says, this is love that you walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning and you should walk in it. Good reference verses if you want them. Romans 5, verses 8 through 10, Ephesians 1 and 2. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. Of course, the word dwelleth, same as the word abideth that we have been using all along. Yea, intimate knowledge word again. This is intimately knowing that we abide with Jesus and he with us, that we tabernacle through the Son to the Father. Now, I, I should have a slide up here with a dead horse on it because I have this saying, you've probably heard it before, when the horse is dead, dismount. So we've focused a lot about the concept of dwelling, abiding, and love. Now, I don't know how long we've been talking. Oh, yes, I do, 21 minutes. So we've spent a lot of time building on that topic. Now, what I want to start doing is taking that topic and seeing how it plays out in some of the very common things that come through the gospel and it will end up in Revelation. We're not done in the letter, but I'm going to start floating around a little bit more here. This is John 14 and 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him, and we will come unto him. And make our abode with him. Hmm, isn't that subtle? If a man loves me, he'll keep my words. My father will love him because he loves me. And then we, you and I, and Jesus, can make our abode with God. And what you have now is a cameo of the marriage supper of the Lamb. This brings us right to the whole purpose of tabernacling that we might be united as one with our Savior to the glory of our Father, that we might abide with him as his family forever. 1 John 4, verse 12, No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Again, we've got agape. That's one, the first one's the verb. The second one's agape, so agapeo, agape. Reference right back to John chapter 1, verse 18, says the exact same thing. The concept, going back to verse 8 of this same uh, 1 John 4, this, is that God is love. That we are completed if we love one another. We, you and I, have been given the opportunity to be the completion of God's love. And if we can love one another to the completion of his perfection... We then are living the tabernacle right now. Hereby we know, intimate word for knowledge, we intimately know that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us his spirit, not the Holy Spirit, rather the spirit of truth. So we then can dwell together or tabernacle together. Now, I want to explain a nugget. Have any of you ever heard me use the phrase the nuggets in scripture? It's not chicken nuggets. Okay, you've got one. Good. So you want to explain it to the group? I'll give you the mic. No. Okay, I'll do it. Now, I use the concept of the nugget. It's like panning for gold. When you're panning for gold, most of what you get is dirt. This is what happens when you do some concordance work. You look up a word, and I look up the word, and it says uh, dwell. And I look it up, and what does it say? Well, that means to dwell. Okay, great. We'll look up the next word. And you might look up 10 words in a verse, and only one of them has something worth chasing. You might look up 10 words in 10 verses, and you've looked up 100 words now, and you only found one of them worth chasing. Ooh, but when you find the one worth chasing, does it not make it worth the search? Just like the guy who's going slob, 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 mud, water, mud. Ooh, that one's shiny. That's the concept of Bible study. That's why we spend time in our concordance so we can find that shiny object that our God has left there for us to find if we would just get out our shovel and slop around a little bit. Well, here's one of those nuggets, and this is one of them that came very recently to me, like as in the last four or five years. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold... 
the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And we've all read that verse a couple times a year. We've read it a number of times. You might get a different perspective of Revelation 21 tonight, I'm hoping by the end, because at least it was new to me. Seeing the concept of the tabernacle was not new. Seeing how it's described in the language of John in Revelation 21 is what is new. I'm getting goosebumps right now, but I know where I'm going and you're not. All right, you don't. Hold on that thought. We're going back to Revelation 21 in a minute. 1 John 4 and 14. We have seen him and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. John 3, 16 and 17. John 15, 26 and 27, going right back to the gospel. The Savior of the order of things to dwell with the Father. So let's have some fun, shall we? Revelation 21 again. We just looked at verse 3. Let's cherry pick for some details that might change your perception a little bit. If not, I'll just think it's cool and you guys can go, yeah, we already knew that. All right, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, the next verse we read introduces the tabernacle, so we know we are right on base. Drop down to verse 12. And I had a wall, great and high, and twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And the names written thereon are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So we are now connecting specifically to New Jerusalem. In fact, at the end of verse 9, it says, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. The description of New Jerusalem in Revelation is the description of the bride and is tied directly to the tabernacle. Look again. Twelve tribes of Israel. You mean those ones in sections and camps around the tent? and the yeah, That exactly. What about the foundation of this bride city? Verse 14. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. You mean those that were the preachers of the good news of the kingdom? Yes. We've got some valuable picture words in the next few verses, but there's one more remarkable detail I want to focus on, and that's verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Putting this all together, brothers and sisters, we are the temple in the kingdom. As the saints of the bride, excuse me, the saints as the bride, dwelling in love, one with the Lord and His Father, tabernacled together, is the concluding thoughts of Jesus as we read the words in Revelation. Now, here's the one that blow, blew my mind, and I've heard other people say, oh, we already knew that, but it's, it was new to me. Maybe it'll strike you. John chapter 1, verse 14. We've all read it. We've quoted it. We've explained this verse a number of times. But I had never, until just a few years ago, had seen the tabernacle in this verse. The Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. And so at the very introduction of John's writings, he's brought the tabernacle to the forefront through the bridegroom, and he ends at the end of Revelation tying us as the bride to New Jerusalem and the temple in the kingdom. Well, now that I have tabernacleitis, I see it everywhere. So this is kind of where it got really interesting. And hopefully, some of these thoughts might change the way you look at the Gospel of John. In fact, between now and December, you get a second shot of all the writings of John. The Gospel, the Epistles, and Revelation. See what you can find as you go through it together. 1 John 4 and 16, we have known and believed, this is the intimate word for know again, we have intimately known and believed that agape, that the love that God hath to us, God is love, 
again, agape, and he that dwelleth in, agape love, dwelleth in God and God in him. It's a great summary verse because that basically says what we just used a lot of clumsy words to make the point. So the last few verses uh, take this theme to you and I personally. Herein is our love, agape, made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment or confidence, as the RSV says. This is how you and I can assure we can stand up before our Lord with confidence that we can dwell with Him and His Father forever. Because as He is, so are we in this world. We've become like Jesus because we love each other and can dwell together in love. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. And all these are agape. I'll stop saying it. That's what the red's for. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because in fear hath torment, or the RSV says punishment, which is probably better than torment anyways. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. And we picture the parable of the talents. And there's no change in the language to those who made use of the talents they had. You had two, you now have four, yay. You had five, you now have ten, yay. It doesn't say, well, you know, you should have done better than that. You had two, you could have made seven or eight. Our God's not interested in us being, uh, achieving more than we're capable of. What he's interested in, in us taking what he's given us and dedicating it to his service so that he can make more of us to his glory. But what was the condemnation to the one that had one talent? The condemnation was he didn't know his father. I knew you were a hard man, reaping where you had not sown, gathering where you had not strawed. He had no idea the love of the father. And his fear demotivated him, and he buried what he was given in the earth. Because he didn't know God, didn't understand the love of God, and was motivated by fear, he was cast into outer darkness. And so that's where it gets very personal to us. Personable, not a good choice. Personal to us. That we know our God, we understand his love, and we demonstrate it to each other because that's what allows us to bear fruit in his family. Proverbs 1 and 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So we should be afraid of God's wrath. There's no doubt of that. We should respect the laws of our God. We should respect the will of our God. But if you and I are truly afraid of our God, it's because we do not intimately know him and his love. And we need to fix that. Because if I want to dwell with the Father forever, I've got to demonstrate that love today. And I have to understand his love to share it with you. So the focus comes on us understanding the love of the Father intimately and having it change who we are so we can demonstrate it to each other. Hebrews 12 and 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Here's 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. So this is immortality. Uh, context, Romans 4 and 17 is a good one. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom it was believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. It's for you and I to have immortality, it's all about us associating with the Son. Colossians 3 and 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, you then shall appear with him in glory. From God to Jesus to us, to dwell together forever. It's the goal of God from the beginning. It's actually the fulfillment of the prayer of Jesus in John 17. So let's look at that for a moment. See if we can highlight some of that. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. The prayer of Jesus to the saving of his disciples is that they would tabernacle together in love with each other, with him, and ultimately with the Father. You and I have the opportunity to be the answer to a prayer of Jesus. 1 John 5, verse 20. 
Now, the green one is the perceived word. The red one is the intimate word. And we perceive that the Son of God has come, and he hath given us an understanding that we may intimately know him that is true, that we are, uh, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So what is the true God? To intimately know him and through Jesus dwell with him eternally. That is our hope and his desire. Give 2 John an honorable mention here. This is 2 John 2. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever, which connects us to the first letter, the dwell with word forever, which we keep talking about. And here, of course, we have in the Greek uh, the word aeon, to the end of the age, that we would, for the truth's sake, dwell in us and that we would be with him to the end of the age, literally building on the tabernacle theme. Here's verse 9. Whoso transgresseth, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he, hath, excuse me, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And therein is the point. For us to show truth in doctrine is an example for us to abide with the Father and the Son. And if we transgress that doctrine, we are outside the camp using Old Testament language. Brothers and sisters, that's Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is one of those things that's really hard to do, but you feel so much better when you do it. But because it's hard to do, we easily can skip the first couple steps, which are there to make it so you don't have to take the other two. Now, Matthew 18 is not on the list of suggestions of Jesus. It's listed as one of the commands of Christ. Why? Because it prevents little problems from becoming big problems. I'll use an example right now. If I said something from the platform, which is probably likely that might have offended you, and you come to me and you say, Dennis, you know, did you mean to say that? I've got two answers for that. I actually said that. That's not how I meant it. And then the next class I get to apologize for what I said I didn't mean and fix it. And you didn't have to go talk to the whole ecclesia about what a miserable brother Dennis is because you and I fixed it. Done. It's already gone. And it was a misunderstanding. So I owned it. You called it. We hug it out. We're good. What, the other option is, yeah, I said that and I meant it. And sorry, you didn't like it too bad. It's the way it is. Well, Dennis needs some help here. So what would Jesus do? Well, he would get somebody else. Let's see if I can find somebody Dennis respects. That might help me. And the two of us are going to go talk to him together. Why? Because now you can leverage a relationship and perhaps get me to see the error of my ways, in which case you don't have to go to the next step, which is get the whole ecclesia involved. Well, that didn't work. So we got the ecclesia involved. That's the last ditch effort. Because if that doesn't work, we have to withdraw fellowship. We cannot no longer abide together in love. But is that how it works all the time in our ecclesial life? Does every time there's a a challenge with an individual in our meeting, do we go to them personally and try to solve it? Our natural human instinct is not to solve the problem I have with you. If I got a problem with you, it's so much easier to talk to her about it than it is to talk to you. And I've skipped step one of Matthew 18, and I've actually made a problem worse, because what if what you said you didn't mean, and you said, well, Dennis, I didn't mean it that way. Sorry it came out that way. We hug it out. We're good. But I've already lit the fire in somebody else who thinks she did something wrong. And sorry, you guys are just in the front row. Lucky you. So the point is, Matthew 18 prevents the problems that can erupt in an ecclesia and split them in half, which is certainly not what our Father wants to see. It's a last resort to withdraw, and that withdrawal must be done out of love. If it's done for any other reason, it's wrong. But the concept of love in the family, as we try to dwell together in unity now, is something we can learn together by how we treat each other. So this, I, the reason I bring it to, to Matthew 18 is Matthew 18, done properly, is in love. That's the whole point in it being there. It allows you and I to demonstrate love one to another even when we disagree. Now, the RSV has for this, anyone who goes ahead and abides not, which takes the transgression word out altogether. It's not about them being evil, but it's about them being outside of the camp. If we do not dwell in the doctrine of truth, then we are godless. It compares to us saying things like, you know, good Christian values or there's nothing wrong with, and we justify things, but the absence of truth makes it wrong. 
we can relate it to the Christian world at large. If we're honest with ourselves, we can apply it to our own individual ecclesias, families, and maybe even person. So let's reread that at the end. He that abides in truth has the Father and Son tabernacled. All right, let's have a little fun, shall we? I'm assuming you're not having fun yet. Psalm 22, what does that have to do with the tabernacle? Oh, only everything. So, Psalm 22, we're all very familiar with this. And the first words from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is the first thing Jesus says from the tree. And it's short because when you're crucified, you die of suffocation. So that's why all seven things he says from the tree are short. But the reason he starts with those words is not because he felt forsaken by the Father, as the churches would teach us, but rather so you and I would know, if you want to know what Jesus is thinking right now, he's telling you where to look. He's giving you the first half of the first verse. And if you look at the entirety of Psalm 22, you get a blow-by-blow description of the crucifixion, which tells you and I and anyone who knew what he was talking about at the crucifixion, Jesus knew exactly what was happening. He knew exactly why it was happening. And he knew exactly what purpose it was happening for. Because that's what Psalm 22 is about. It's noted in uh, both, both Matthew and Mark's uh, uh, gospel record. Now, verse 24 of Psalm 22 uh, removes the, perf- the, the suggestion that he was feeling forsaken by God. This is not a doubt in the, wor- in the words of our Lord Jesus. Verse 24 tells us without a doubt, he had no doubt, but he had surrendered to the will of the Father in the garden. So we'll focus on what it, what it means. See if we can put this in perspective. So Elohim, Elohim, emphasis, emphasized reference to the mighty ones, the ministering spirits that had been accompanying him on his entire journey. And he used the word help. The Oxford margin adds, from my salvation. The actual word is Yehoshua, a feminine word meaning salvation or deliverance of the saints. What was on the mind of Jesus as he was dying? Delivering his bride. He was thinking about you and I as he was hung on that tree. That language makes it not only about those before us and those with him, but personally about you and I. It lines up exactly with the prayer of John 17, which continued not just to his disciples of the day, but to all those that would believe on him thereafter. That we might all be one with him and each other as he is with his Father. Now everybody's talked about Psalm 22, verse 6. It's the most powerful verse in the psalm. Not going to go through it tonight. Uh, But just the concept of being pinned to the tree, give birth, and die. That's effectively why it's uh, given us us perfect imagery of the tabernacle and the purpose of the work of Jesus. Now, in this psalm, we are reflecting to the last few hours of Jesus' life. It ends in glory as his death provides life that you and I might have hope to be in the congregation of praise evermore. Have you ever noticed that the next two psalms take the story from there? We actually brought this up in the readings. I don't know if it was last night or the night before in in Camp Judah. Fittingly, the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, but whatever. Let's look at Psalm 23 and see if we can't get some clues to find it in the context. You probably all know it by by, uh, verbatim. You want to say it out loud with me, you can. But here's the piece I want to look for. If Psalm 22 tells us the purpose of Jesus in the past, his crucifixion, can we find clues that Psalm 23 is Jesus in his current state right now? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. Why? For his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now look at this. You have prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will tabernacle in the house of Yahweh forever. And notice the very end, it shifts to the tabernacle language with the Father and the Son forever. What about Psalm 24? 
If Psalm 22 is Jesus in the past and Psalm 23 is Jesus in the present, I wonder if we can find in Psalm 24 Jesus in his future state. So here's Psalm 24-ish. I picked apart a few verses. It's a little longer than the other two. The Lord, uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that tabernacle therein. There's number one, verse one, tabernacle filling the earth. Verse three, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in his holy place? And now we're in Zion. Verse 5, he shall receive the blessing from Yahweh and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Salvation at last. We have been tabernacled with the Father and the Son, filled the earth with his glory, the ascension of Mount Zion, and salvation has come from Yahweh. Psalm 22, the past. Psalm 22, the present. Psalm 23, the future state of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our hope and our desire. The psalm ends by repeating the question, who is the king of glory? The final answer being, Yahweh of hosts. He is the king of glory. Let's close our thoughts tonight by turning to the last few words of John and Jesus, and this is Revelation chapter 22, and we're going to note them with emphasis. He that is unjust, picking up at verse 11, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through why, the gates of the city. What city is that? New Jerusalem, the bride prepared on the foundations with the apostles. For without are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these words, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. He which testifieth of these things, saying, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.